we have needs, and some are more important than others, or some become more prioritised if we don't have them, like our physiological needs for shelter and food and water and so on. And when, we've meet, when we meet those, we can, our needs then shift into things like social needs relating to other human beings. And once we've dealt with those things, we then go on to growth and uh, basically finding our purpose in life and to what's called self-actualise. And so I'm, my talk is framed inside these three stages. So starting off with uh, existence, meeting our needs, and I'm going to say a little bit about my own story and how permaculture changed me. And I, uh, in my 20s, I came out of university with a degree in physics. I thought, I don't really know what to do with this. And uh, I got into working with animals. So I spent five years doing animal rescue, um, literally on the ground picking up shit and all that. And I also spent five years doing campaigning against vivisection. Um, both very reactive though, looking back thinking that I didn't really know what to do, I was just seeing problems and I thought, okay, what can I do about it? Lots of picking up the, you know, picking up the pieces and saying no. And then I uh, did my PDC, my permaculture design course, and it actually, permaculture hunted me down. So I was living in a, a shared house and one of the people in our house organized a permaculture design course in our house and I couldn't really run away. <laughs> and uh, back here, I, I met somebody who was doing permaculture and they had the first two permaculture books and they looked very interested but I was too busy doing this. So anyway, it finally caught up with me and this is our permaculture design course, one of the projects we did. You'll notice there's only four of us and to this day I'm still happy I said, okay, my teacher, Stephen Nart, very kindly did a course for just four of us. It was financially a complete must, must have been a disaster. But um, I, I still try and to look at that and say, okay, we don't have many people, but it's about spreading the word. And let's just do that. So obviously I try not to have every course with only four people on. So, but this gave me a new way of seeing the world and to come at it from a more creative perspective. How, how can we do something different? How can we set an example? So one of the things I got from this uh, design course was Bill Mollison's Great Gift, which uh, is given to everyone who learns permaculture, which is a pair of permagoggles. <laughs> okay. So those of you who recognize the um, little low, beautiful drawing on the front of the designer's manual would know that sign. But essentially, when you learn permaculture, you see the world in a new way. Um, some of the time you see, what were they thinking about? What a mess, what were they doing? But you also see many possibilities, and that's for me, is what's exciting about permaculture, the potential to do things. So um, I spent a year trying to figure out, having done that design course, how do I apply that in my life? So I went to live in Ireland uh, on the side of a mountain. You can see it's, uh, they understood microclimates. <laughs> they put their houses, surrounded their houses by lots of uh, shrubbery and trees. We, I grew a garden, we used to eat salads like this from the garden and uh, it was a very beautiful time and I felt very disconnected from most people because there was only three of us living there most of the time and I missed the community, I missed connecting to people and when people came to visit I loved that opportunity to share what we were doing, take people around the garden, show them the different plants and so on and uh, have them completely boggled about, wow, what's this <laughs> you can put in the salad. So uh, I came back to England, I made a few gardens around and about, this is one, the cottage garden that we made, we're making use, so bringing in a few permaculture principles, principles for nature, so nature produces no waste, uh, so this is an old bathtub turned into a pond, and uh, working with nature, so we have chickens in the garden to do pest control, but they also did a superb job of taking uh, bark chippings and turning it in compost, so they composted for us. People tend to talk about you know, worm composting, chicken composting is very good too. This was another garden I made. Um, again, produced no waste because the decking is made from mostly pallets. Um, but it also was a great lesson to me because I rushed in and I didn't spend time. So in permaculture, what we, we commonly say is spend time observing your environment. You need to understand where you are. And my landlady said, I'd like to make a decking out of pallets, so I just I was in a hurry to make a garden, I put the pallets down, made the garden, and then realised when I started thinking about the value of the decking, um, I realised that this was certainly not big enough, and so I ended up building decking over my garden. 
I'll never do that again. <laughs> so, uh, all this doesn't show up very well. Um, so another thing in permaculture is looking at how we use space. So planning the space around that. And so this is uh, coming back to so the caravan again and its relationship to a hedge here. And uh, this was a shed behind where I kept my bicycle. So I, I mapped out the, air, the spaces um, in terms of how often I use them. So there's a desire line, what's called a desire line, um, coming into the, the field across to the front door. And uh, that was my main desire line, so that became what's called zone one, the area where I give most attention to, where I would do most of my gardening. That included the decking, so here's some of my zone one garden. But there's also another zone, which is if I went to get my bicycle from here, then that was the route I'd take. So this other area got quite a lot of attention, not as much as here. So we're thinking about how we use space and placing things in the space in order to maximize the potential for that. And even within the salads here, I'm putting little garlic bulbs in order to um, create some pest control. Uh, it's amazing the difference in my planting garlics in my salads, which were also in turn right outside my back door. And uh, there's, I've not paid any attention to my notes so far. So, but anyway, ah, yes. So another thing in permaculture, something we see in nature, is diversity, a huge diversity. And the more diversity we see, the more beneficial relationships are likely to be taking place in those spaces. And, uh, and in turn, you get a much more stronger, resilient ecosystem. And so in permaculture, we, we tend to plant polyculture gardens well, you see a lot of things all growing together, but there's a very deliberate planning process about how we put things together, what we think about, where we're placing what in relation to who, in order to create beneficial relationships. And we're also seeing use of vertical space here growing upside, the outside of the caravan, and this is quite early because this really took over here, but making use of vertical space as well. And then I took that same idea of creating diversity in the garden and applied it to the way I made a livelihood. So um, initially I started off as, well I became a gardener because I love gardens, I love trees, and I started doing gardening for people and slowly started to do little bits of permaculture design and teaching and so on. And, uh, and also, perhaps one of the more bizarre ones, was that I used to make salads for celebrations because the place I lived in the caravan was uh, another small community, curiously, of three people. <laughs> it seems to be a pattern for me. And, and so we'd have these um, celebrations for the quarters and the cross quarters, you know, with the midwinter and midsummer solstices and so on. And I would make a, a salad from my garden. I didn't have a lot of financial wealth, but I had a huge wealth in the garden. And I'd make them beautifully because it was a celebration, I photographed them, and my landlady, who was an artist, suggested I put them into frames and put them in a, an art exhibition, which I did, and people bought pictures of my salads. <laughs> <laughs> so I, there's all these different uh, yields, if you like, from this uh, particular situation. So I'm learning how to grow plants, I'm learning about their relationships, um, there's the celebration, the art, there's the, um, the eating, the enjoyment of the flavour of the salads. And then, of course, uh, ultimately there's the, the financial income from uh, selling pictures. And bizarrely, I even entered um, a permaculture art competition many years ago and won a jug that leaks. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, I still sit on my windowsill and I think one day I'll find somebody who can glaze that properly. <laughs> And over time, I did less and less gardening and more and more permaculture teaching, which has been great for me. And there are other little bits and pieces I do now, including writing as well. So. And then we're also looking at patterns in nature and how nature uses different forms to do different things. And this is a whole huge subject, which I'm currently writing about. But uh, this is a, a year, it's one of the things I made. In fact, if you come to the conference of uh, convergence, You'll see this yurt, it won't look this white anymore um, in one of the fields as we put it up yesterday. But the, the yurt um, is essentially a dome shape. And a dome uh, or a half sphere has the least surface area for its volume, or a sphere has the least surface area. So it's, 
It's um, very protective in terms of reducing the amount of heat from the space. And it's no coincidence that the uh, Mongolians who built these things and used them originally, and still do, and uh, the Inuits make their igloos also in dome shapes because they have least surface area to lose heat from. But you'll also see um, in African, African countries often the same shape because it's about stopping the heat getting into the buildings. So you're trying to keep the building cool. So we can apply nature's patterns to perform particular functions. And uh, sadly, we don't seem to be very good at this at the moment. And then uh, community. So we're moving on to that next level. So we've gone from existence to relatedness. And so for me, uh, it's really important being part of a community. And it's one of the things I love about permaculture is that um, there's community everywhere you go. And I, I arrive at an event like this, and I see so many familiar faces. And we can reconnect and hear about the stories of what they've been doing. This is a small community project I was part of that ran for 10 years in our little local town, Bridport. And uh, very much uh, didn't just recycle lots and lots of waste from the environment and rebuild bicycles and uh, put lots of cardboard back into the system and so on. But it's also recycled people. It brought people in who were finding it really difficult in life, um, things with addictions and so on. And it gave them something of purpose, something to do without judgment. And uh, I saw some great success stories there as well around that. And then another community I was part of, which was learning Aikido, which uh, I went into thinking this is something you know, for me to learn uh, for myself. But I realized how much, it, again, that's all about community. It's uh, very much a cooperative kind of martial art. So I did, one of my designs was to design how I learned Aikido. Now, this is something that I, was, I feel blessed to have been a part of. So a friend of ours, um, they bought some land. They finally, after 10 years, managed to find some land so to start a farm. They didn't have a house on it. And uh, so they, they took a risk. They said, we're going to build a house. And we need to build it in four days <laughs> while it's over Easter. So no one could bring up the council because it's not illegal to, to build a house. It's only illegal to carry on building a house if, you start, uh, if you're told to start. And you still need to get permission to live in it anyway afterwards. Now, they were very confident about that, and they have subsequently got permission. But this is the house they built, and they built it um, initially in cardboard, as you can see, <laughs> in order to get a sense of um, how this would be. But they built it as a family, so the four of them decided that we're going to cut out lots of boxes and, uh, and put them together and just create something in 3D that they'd all be happy with. And so... Myself, my partner, and about 30 other people turned up a few years ago and spent four days helping them to build their house, um, which was built in sections originally, and we just helped them put it together. So this is day one. Um, this is all the turf from underneath the floor. It's all gone on one side, but it's going on the roof later. The main structure went up in day one. That was the only day it rained, thankfully. Day two, um, getting the, uh, starting to get the infill and the cladding on. This is loose wool, which they put in to the roof. That was a very cheap way for them to do that. The downside of that they've discovered subsequently is the moths that love to live in that and also then come out and eat their clothes. So that was the one thing they do differently. Uh, day three, still working on the roof and so on, filling it in from underneath. Uh, everybody's involved. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then... Finally, so even time for a bit of football here. You can see the police going in. But essentially, in four days, we put up the house. We went back. Uh, I went back one week later, and uh, everyone had essentially gone. So it was a little bit finished off. So the panel and uh, the rest of the veranda decking. But that's essentially what it looked like after four days. And the experience of being part of that house building uh, community thing was just a gift the real gift and every time they walk around their house this is oh no that's not their house um, they're reminded of the people that helped them to build the house so that's the power of having a network and so for me um, the other thing that permaculture has given me is a real strong sense of purpose in my life i found my path and the things i've done before have been a part of me learning the things i needed to learn in order to put me on this path but um so but now, a lot of the time I spend teaching permaculture. Um, I take people 
to uh, inspiring places, like this is back in Mark's house again, inside, and people are just uh, love the opportunity to go and see um, and be inspired by. So it's, permaculture is about educating in new ways, but it's also about inspiring people and also putting, putting us into a network so that we can work together and collaborate. Permaculture is very much about looking at cooperative relationships and how can we build those, and that includes us as well. And, and of course, in nature, there's always succession. One plant leads, uh, creates a space for the next one, the next species to come in. And the same is true for us. So I now be, I'm in a privileged position to then help other permaculture teachers come through and learn their craft as well. And I'm often working with other people who are learning and then going on to teach their own design courses. And uh, I'm still doing the whole permaculture gardening thing. So identifying microclimates, like this one in our cottage garden. So frost, less frost, no frost. No frost under the bottom of a cat either. So. <laughs> water bats, this is a nice little thermal image of the difference water makes to temperature. And so uh, we saw this opportunity, and that's where we put the apricot tree and the grapevines. So, so this is... Uh, making the best of our current little garden space. And just to say a little bit at the end about the permaculture community. So these are the people who've just done a course with us. Uh, they were all crazy, but that's partly my fault, I think. <laughs> um, and for me, the permaculture design course is also a, it's a niche, a microclimate. It's somewhere that, yes, people come together, they... Um, they find very, very quickly that sense of community. And I think for me, one of the most important things about doing a design course and what gives me hope for the future is that when we come together around a common theme, a common goal, then we very, very quickly connect with each other and we create those communities. And just to uh, wave at you, a whole heap of treasures that I have, oh that's something else entirely, which are all the cards I've had from people who've done permaculture courses with me, uh, including this really crazy one, which is written inside the tub of a Heinz Farmer's Market soup, because we thought that was incredibly ironic. <laughs> so uh, I made a comment and somebody actually went out and found a box of that. But just to uh, read from this one, which was from a recent course, from somebody who used to come in late in the morning and was looked, always looked a bit tired, and I thought, oh, maybe he's just slacking off a bit and not you know, being a bit distracted by something. And I had a little chat with him on the fire, around the fire at the end of the course, and, uh, and connected with him, he was saying he was just finding it really difficult to sleep because his brain was buzzing with all the possibilities of what he could do when he got home. And what he wrote in the card was, uh, these words. He just said, words can't describe the profound joy, learning, vision, and direction you've brought into my life. And for me, that's just the permaculture, what permaculture does for people, and uh, that's why I think permaculture is such a powerful force for change. Thank you very much. The format of this this morning's session will be that we'll do the 20-minute uh, se uh, sessions flowing one from to the next, and that then at the end the, uh, the men will stand and answer questions. So um, whilst we just wait for a quick changeover here, would you please take a seat um, if you don't have a seat? Because um, once this room is has a number of people in it that could fit on seats. It's declared full, apparently, and we're not allowed to let anyone else in because of the fire regulations. Um, let me know when you're ready. So I we're think ready. I haven't had the chance to speak for very long with Dave and Paul, Paul, but I think it's great to see, from my perspective, I'm seeing a second generation in permaculture because they're a little bit older than more, and more mature than my own children. Um, so, if, if even though they're not directly related to the project that they're talking about, they've had a, a blossoming and great opportunities as interns. 
So even if your own children um, seem to disappoint, <laughs> we can always invest in other people's children. And I think this is a great, great example of that. So thank you. Right on. Thanks, everyone. Good morning. Um, actually, turn this thing so I can see what's going on. So as April mentioned, my name is Dave Bainline, and uh, this is Paul. And we both lived at the Bullock's Permaculture Homestead for a while. As she mentioned, uh, we both showed up there as interns. And Paul ended up spending two years there. I ended up spending seven years there. And so um, I became more than an intern after a while. I'm currently their education director. I help manage all their education programs. Uh, I ran their intern program for a long time, so on and so forth. And um, while we were there, uh, Paul and I both uh, worked with Doug, sort of the eldest of the Bullock brothers, and eventually we put together a design company called Terra Phoenix Design. And we basically travel all over the place and help people put together master plans for their permaculture projects. So um, the reason I mention that is because this site is like the original source for a lot of what we do. This is where we were able to actually have our feet on the ground over a period of time. I've now been affiliated with this site, working with this site. My second family is essentially at this site for, I think it's 11 years now. And so, uh, you know, very different than woofing at several different farms or, you know, volunteering at several different farms across the globe, putting in a long, contiguous period of time working with the same piece of property um, gives us a lot of frame of reference on everything that we help other people to do with their designs. So, uh, to get started, this is where we're at. So if you go up to the northwest of the United States and you go out into the Puget Sound, Orcas Island is where the Bullets Permaculture Homestead is. They started uh, the project about 35 years ago and the Bullocks have uh, 10 acres that they own. So that's roughly four hectares that they own and then another four hectares that they lease from a neighbor. And that lease, no money changes hands. They just, uh, they work that land as agricultural land, which means that owner doesn't have to pay residential taxes, he only pays agricultural taxes, which are uh, a pittance by comparison. Uh, in addition to that, we plant stuff all over the place on the property around us uh, with permission from neighbors, uh, sometimes surreptitiously, but we are slowly expanding the positive influence of that site all over. We're in a Mediterranean climate type, uh, so that means we have uh, cool, dry summers. Sometimes it won't rain for three months at a time. And then we've got uh, warm or cool, wet winters as well. We don't get super cold, but we get plenty cold, and uh, it rains all winter. Uh, analog climates, if you're interested in thinking about other parts of the world where you might see something very similar to, we, to where we are, uh, parts of Chile, Croatia, uh, the South Island of New Zealand, Launceston in Tasmania. And the soils on the property are interesting. Uh, most of the property is actually fairly poor. It was scoured by glaciers. It's you know, exposed bedrock and gravel. And then we have an area where there's actually some rich bottom land. So if we look at this slide, this is a map that sort of helps you to, to see what the whole property looks like that a friend of ours put together. Uh, basically what you can see is we're located on a southwest facing slope. And so for a northern climate, this is pretty much the best you can, you can find. Um, as you come, you know, up here's the top of the hill and there's probably uh, at least 150, 100 feet of elevation change across the property. I think it's a little more. And uh, it was subdivided originally from the neighbor. He had 150 acres, and after the Bullocks had worked with him for a period of time, he said, draw your lines. Where do you, what do you want to buy? So they got to choose what they purchased. Um, you'll notice this access path coming through right here. It goes across the whole property. That is essentially a, um, a key line on the property. And I'm not going to go into the full details of what key line design is. You can look that up if you want more information. But essentially, uh, that is a break in the property. And below that point is where all the rich soils are. Above that point is where it's exposed bedrock and a lot of glacial till and so on and so forth. And so you'll notice the big green blobs, which are different gardens and different types of vegetation, are predominantly occurring below that line. Those three spots are where the three um, Bullock family units are. So people always talk about the Bullock brothers. I like to talk about the Bullock family as a whole because it's not just these three brothers, it's these three brothers and their wives and their kids that are all working together to make the project really flourish. And so we've got 
uh, Doug and Mario over at this end, Sam and you go down here, and Joey and Irina up at the top of the hill. And each of these family units has a, sort of a realm around their home where they get to choose what they want to plant, and they get to grow whatever they want. And so they have a degree of autonomy. It's not um, a decision by consensus across the board on things. And so if you look at the houses that they've put together, this was the only house that existed on the property when they purchased it. And it's been renovated, it was an old farmhouse. And um, it used to just be surrounded by grass, now it's been renovated and it's surrounded by fruit trees, flowers, perennial vegetables, all kinds of things. And it really stands out to me as an example of how aesthetics and permaculture go hand in hand. This is Doug and Maria's house, which was uh, new construction on the property. It's very small, 750 square feet, that's about 70 square meters. So very small for a family of four, as most people would think. And we'll talk in just a moment about why it actually works. But in general, if you look at the design of the home, uh, passive solar design. The eaves come out and the windows are placed just such that low angle winter sun gets into the home. High angle summer sun is blocked by the eaves, so it performs well in all times of year. Um, Outside the home, you can see that they've got uh, big patios to spend time. The landscape is filled with flowers. There's water features moving through the landscape. And all of this is a nod to habitat. Pollinators, pest predator insects, lizards, all kinds of things like that are supported here. And so the more they build habitat from the way they see it, the more everything else is going to thrive and function. Uh, also, the home I wanted to mention if you notice the roof shape, that's built off of fractal geometry. So if you go inside and you look at all the rafters, they lay out in the spiral of the conch shell. So they all have their own individual homes, uh, which are in those three spots we looked at before. The nicest spot on the property is actually right in the middle of their three homes. And they all chose not to put any individual's home in that central location, but rather they chose to save that really nice spot as a spot they could all share. So that's sort of the center of their community. That's where when they have potlucks, everybody gets together here. That is where a bunch of things happen. Uh, and this is what we call the Aloha Lodge. This is our classroom. It's a giant tent that we put up in the summer, take down in the winter. And we use it for everything from just a dry place to be in the shoulder seasons. Um, we dry garlic here. We teach classes here, so on and so forth. We've got a pizza oven and an outdoor kitchen in this space. And um, all of this kind of infrastructure that really ties into having people spend time together. So the Bullocks, I mentioned Doug's house is really small, and part of the reason that works is because they're taking advantage of the outside. Our weather is really nice most of the year. So during the summer, Doug and Mario, whose house we just looked at, they don't even spend time in there hardly. They've got an outdoor sleeping platform. They've got an outdoor kitchen. They've got outdoor showers. They pretty much live outside in our climate during the summer because... Why wouldn't you? It's beautiful. Uh, and the same thing goes for the other folks that have integrated with our community as well. Which brings us to our intern program. So we have a program, we call it our skill building program. And for all those skill builders, their lodging is spread throughout the property. So where we've got the sort of three cornerstone Bullock families, and in the center we've got our community area. Um, there are tent platforms and caravans and trailers and things that are dotting all over the landscape so that each intern, each person who's there spending time working with us, has their own spot. And we find that that works really well for everybody to have their own private space where they can get away but then comes together in a community space. Um, when you're there at, for, as part of the skill building program, you've got a responsibility of managing annuals. We require that people stay for a full growing season and they're managing garden beds in the annual gardens. They're managing uh, fruit trees, nut trees, perennial vegetables in a perennial zone. And they also have a rotating uh, specialization. So one month you might work on chickens or work with the chickens. The next month you might be working with greenhouses. After that you might be managing a nursery, so on and so forth. Um, and so they are a really important piece of the whole picture now as the, pro as the project's developed. The Bullocks had people asking to be interns early on. And they, they kept saying no to people for 12 years because they felt really strongly that before we take on interns, we want to have something here to teach them. We want to have something to show. So it wasn't like the project started on the backs of interns. It was we held off on having interns for a full 12 years before they brought them in and started to utilize them on the site. And we also teach a bunch of classes. 
So teaching classes is a really great way to do two things. Number one, this is, this is a way for us to import energy in the form of cash. We can bring in some money for teaching classes, and it also is a way for us to export our knowledge. So whether we're teaching how to inoculate logs with mushrooms that you could grow commercially or at home, or whether we're teaching a permaculture design course or whatever it is, these are all important parts of what we do on the property. Oops, that's the wrong computer. So, food production is another major theme of what we have going on at the property. And you'll notice these lower circles are around the big green spots. These are predominantly dedicated to annuals. So these are where our annual gardens are. Notice they're the lowest point on the hill. That's where the richest soils are. So we've concentrated the annual gardens there. And then we've got things like this. And realistically, the entire hillside is covered with interesting things that we'll talk about. We've got annual gardens that are all grown as polycultures, which means we're not just growing big fields of one thing generally. We're mixing in all sorts of things. We've got tons of things to support pollinators. And you can see we do a lot with season extension. In our climate, if we uh, give plants a little help, there's a lot of plants we can grow right through the winter. And then we've got perennial zones. So when we get up into our rougher soils, we're looking at those analog climates I mentioned at the beginning, and we're trying to figure out what kinds of things grow there in the native soils. And so monkey puzzles from Chile, uh, fuki from Japan, these are crops that really do well in some of those other soils throughout the property. I'm going to hand it off to Paul, and he is going to talk to you about livestock. Hi. Uh, mind you, 35 years of permaculture compressed into 20 minutes. Um, there's a lot here that won't get covered, but feel free to talk to Dave, myself, or um, Jane is the third member of our party if you, par party, uh, if you have any other questions. But um, we'll cruise through some of these other things in the time that we have. Uh, so livestock. Animals are a big part of this, but not a huge part. Um, the livestock is limited to poultry. Uh, Yes. Uh, livestock is limited to birds, so pretty much chickens, ducks, um, bees, and a little bit of worms. Um, chickens are done in a forage system. Uh, seasonally, they are underneath, um, or they come through tractors and clean out the annual gardens. Uh, and then during the summer, after the gardens have been planted, uh, they range under the fruit orchards and the nut orchards. Electro-netting fencing is an amazing resource for animal management, especially small, small animals like this. Um, ducks are slug patrol. They monitor uh, slug production. They eat a lot of mollusks in the garden and are um, generally pretty lovable characters. This is also Doug, uh, our third business partner, as Dave mentioned. Bees are... Yeah, kept primarily as pollinators. We do collect a bit of honey, but um, that's sort of a, a, a byproduct. Uh, the goal is how many animals can we have out here helping us with our food production systems. And another big part of the animal systems is the wildlife on site. Uh, this big blue blob is what is um, known as the marsh and sits in a large bottomland uh, in the top of this drainage here. And this was previously, maybe in the early 1900s, drained um, and turned into really productive farm field. When the Bullocks bought the land, it was still really rich bottom soil, some of the best soil on the land. But instead, they opted to plug that drainage ditch, rehabilitate the marsh, and move all of their annual production up here. Because what they could see was that this marsh as a resource was infinitely more valuable than the topsoil. Topsoil can be made. A marsh like this is something that um, can be made, but uh, it takes a lot more energy. So the marsh currently has you know, been rehabilitating for about 25 years, has gone through a number of different cycles in succession, and is now home to otters, muskrats, minks, all type of uh, waterfowl, migratory birds, um, songbirds, uh, small amount of fish, and interestingly, um, a uh, population of turtles. I just find this one to be super fascinating, but uh, Doug, from his house up here, reintroduced turtles into the marsh. They were a native species that had been eliminated with the farming. Uh, they were reintroduced, and now every season, or every year, uh, the turtles actually come back up to their original nesting ground, which was an aquarium in Doug's house. They walk up onto the patio, 
onto the front door and let him know that spring is officially here. <laughs> um, so this is a view of the marsh. You can see it's pretty extensive uh, and very productive. Again, not conventional crops in here, but um, you know, all sorts of marsh plants can be harvested for soil production, uh, fed into compost piles and so on. Um, and the value of this is, is much more than just the wildlife, though that's awesome. Uh, it is a massive, massive um, store of energy in the form of water, right? All of our living organisms and living systems require water, and so the Bullocks have created this marsh and then built this whole capillary vascular system that is cycling water out of this marsh and pumping it through their landscape. And then that water percolates back down into the marsh or into the watershed and then gets pumped up again and cycles through the landscape. So there's a whole huge collection. And it's based on a very simple principle, um, but it has become an insanely complex system. Uh, the simple principle is direct solar. So when the sun is shining, it hits these panels and pumps um, these pumps. Uh, this moves water up to the top of the hill. And if we scoot back two steps, uh, there are massive holding tanks, 70,000 gallon holding tank at the top of the hill made of ferrocement, and then a couple of 20,000 gallon tanks strategically located throughout the landscape. And so when the sun is shining and your crops are being dried out, the solar pumps are running, moving water to the top of the hill, which then serves as a giant battery and can move that energy out into the landscape for free, right? Uh, when the sun isn't shining and your crops are doing fine, you don't need so much water. So it's a very elegant and simple solution, but the volume of pipes and valves and tanks that are running through this landscape is just really mind-boggling. It takes at least Doug and Sam and maybe a couple other heads scratching to figure out how to, how to navigate this thing. Holding tanks. Um, in terms of solar and active solar, uh, you know, electrically speaking, there's a very minimal use of electricity on the landscape. Uh, and a couple of large arrays, maybe four or five large, like four or five kilowatt arrays, uh, that power just the usual household needs. And, and again, very small. It's charging a couple of lights, charging a couple of batteries, and running maybe a stereo system. There's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of other big things. Um, this is the stereo cart, another great use of solar, just a little independent cart that turns garden work into a dance party, often. Uh, also in terms of energy, um, there's a fair amount of passive solar design. As Dave pointed out, the architecture of the buildings is set up to maximize solar gain when you want it and minimize solar gain when you don't. Uh, there's a half dozen or more greenhouses strategically placed around the landscape. This one is adjacent to a building. Uh, it doesn't necessarily feed into the building, but it is um, you know, a zone one staple and allows for easy access to uh, young, young crops in the early season. Um, in terms of the larger community space in the middle of the property, there's a massive greenhouse which facilitates a lot of the plant propagation and such. Um, and attached to that greenhouse is a whole water or a, a sauna, which is this building back here. Um, and a whole hot water heating system. So in terms of renewable energy, oftentimes we look straight to solar, but if you think about wood, it's kind of a very old, original, um, renewable energy source, depending on the way that we manage that wood lot, right? We can cut it all down, all time, okay. Uh, the last thing is a nursery and a living library, possibly their longest lasting legacy because for hundreds of years in the future, you will find monkey puzzle palm trees growing on the San Juan Islands. Um, we're done, but if you have questions, uh, feel free to contact Permaculture Portal or talk to Dave, myself, or Jane. We've got some contact cards on the front table. And we'll take questions at the end. Pietro, um, and he studied with you, did he not? Oh, yeah. It's all my fault. Yeah, it's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he tells me that he's a great example, but we can't see it, that he's much healthier than he was before he started this journey. 
Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I was <thinking> inflation. <laughs> Not inflation. Please, please share, share with us yeah, Okay, three, two, one, go. Good morning to everyone. I'm Pietro. I'm the founder of the Permagasio Institute of Italy and also the coordinator. So let's go through. Let's go through. Let's go through. Nothing. The right, right push button. the right button. All oh, right. Okay. And remember to let's go through. To speak slowly, uh, that's me. Okay. You can speak slowly. All right. Yeah. So that's me with a nice uh, seat ball. <laughs> that uh, I spread around. So let's do a very short and brief introduction by myself. Uh, basically, I did uh, a permaculture design certificate with Aranya. There. Yeah and also a Diploma in Applied Permaculture Design with the Permaculture Association of Britain. Then also I've done a course with the Regenerative Agricultural Design with Darren Doherty in 2011, with Arania also. <laughs> yeah. And also forest gathering course with Martin Crawford and Brin Thomas. Then with Ben Law I did a Sustainable Food Management uh, uh, course and also I got uh, a Bachelor of Science with honors in environmental studies with the Open University in England. Then also a uh, arboricultural course with the Royal Forest Society and a beekeeping, uh, several courses with the British Beekeeping Association. Experiences. Uh, I did uh, uh, different permaculture designs in UK for my diploma in applied permaculture and also um, some apprentice, uh, apprentice with uh, Arania during his uh, permaculture design courses. Also, I did a lot of uh, land-based permaculture design in Italy, and uh, I designed the demonstration site, uh, and also I have implemented the Permaculture uh, Institute of Italy uh, demonstration site. Uh, I, I am also on the PRI Australia teacher register since 2010, and also I collaborated uh, with Ken Yeomans uh, from uh, Keyline Design uh, in regard uh, of uh, the Keyline uh, system I have uh, on my property. Uh, then I did uh, 20 PDC in Italy and I have taught uh, uh, to 400 students uh, from all over the world in five years. And uh, last year I, I have been invited to the Senate of Rome uh, to present uh, Permagash. So. Today I will tell you my story and I will uh, speak with my heart. And that's uh, from where it all started. This was uh, my allotment in UK, in Crowborough, in Sussex. So here we can see clearly a nice hedge, you see, with different uh, uh, fruit trees, uh, trained fruit trees, and also I uh, use uh, a vertical space as well. Uh, putting, for example, some rosemary and uh, uh, other kind of uh, biannual, annual uh, plants uh, underneath. But the space was like uh, probably something like 50 centimeters wide. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is important because the hedge is uh, the hedge effect is one of permaculture principle. Okay, one of the big models of permaculture principle, which is basically means the hedge is the most diverse environment on earth. On earth. Why? Because uh, it will uh, basically take the environment on one side, the environment on the other side, and putting uh, all together, creating in another environment. So it's uh, a very diverse uh, uh, space, probably the most diverse on this planet. Okay, but I also <coughs> was on the edge, which is different. Okay, I was walking on the edge. Why? Because I was running a taxi, an ecolo a rural ecologic taxi service, okay, in East Sussex. Ecologic, why? Because I was using uh, recycled biodiesel. So it was a biodiesel made uh, by Peter, a friend of mine in uh, Hastings, and basically was collecting uh, used oil from fish and ships in Hastings, which we got a lot of them, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then he was cleaning the oil and uh, transforming it in uh, biodiesel. Okay, so I was using biodiesel uh, in my taxis. But this was one part of the story. Why I was on the edge was because uh, after a long hours of working on my, on my taxi, we are talking about between 12 and 14 hours a day, I start to have, after seven years, several uh, 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 health issues. Okay, so I was saying before, I, 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 you know, 
uh, inflating myself in the sense of I was quite uh, uh, heavy and big because a long hour driving and also probably with my uh, liver because I was eating a lot so, and not moving much, etc. So for this reason uh, I start to think that uh, I had to move on from this uh, business, from, from this kind of life. Okay? And so what I did, a permaculture design course. And guess with boom, we go here. With Arana, again. So uh, this one I did with Arana, Steve Preacher, and uh, other uh, teacher in 2008. Okay. And uh, after that, uh, I started to understand things and uh, started to obtain a yield. Okay. But what is it, a yield in permaculture? Okay. A, a, a yield in permaculture is not only fruits or veg, but is also stay together with the family growing our food, for example, and inviting friends, so sociality, beauty is part of our yield. Okay, so we have to see a yield more widely. Beauty is a yield in permaculture, for example. Okay, so I start to see things more clearly now, as you see in my Politana. And then I started to have a diversity of yield, as we, we were just saying and uh, diversity of yield and positive relationship. So I built a one square meter pond. And on this, uh, there is a small uh, permaculture story. Here is not very visible, but here we got some smooth newts. So as soon as I did that one square meter pond, what happened was the council asked me to remove the pond straight away. I said, why? Wow, it's a one square meter pond. You know, it's like a pool. There's not any problem. The depth was like 30 centimeters, no more than that. But as soon as the council asked me this, my son, Ilan, he spotted the news. And the news, as we can see, are protected under Schedule 5 of the one larger countryside act, 1981. So I told uh, Natural England, or, uh, there is a couple of uh, uh, national organizations, and they called, you know, Mr. Foot, which was the allotment manager, you know, a lot of manager in England. Okay? And uh, they, they ask you, say, yes, you can remove the bond, no problem. But it costs you a little bit of money because uh, we need to send you a couple of scientists to make sure that you remove the bond properly without harming the news. <laughs> I think the bond is still there, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> and then after this, I say, okay, freedom from the manager, with a lot of manager, and uh, each element in a system has more than one faction. So I start to apply this permaculture principle, harvesting water from my polytunnel. So why the polytunnel, which is an element of a system, has got more than one function? Because I harvest water, I get shelter during rainy days, within England, you know, we got quite a lot of them, and then also I was growing my food as well, animals, okay, vegetables. And uh, so that's why I apply my, my, this, this, this permaculture principle here. And then also I start to learn from nature and I start to build natural beekeeping top bar hives. So this is a, a very ancient uh, beekeeping system from uh, North Africa. And uh, basically what happened here, why is it natural? Because it's got uh, another shape of the comb. So have you never seen a square or rectangular Comb in nature? Did you ever see? No. Yes? No. no. Because uh, the shape of the comb, uh, the natural comb, is very close to the shape of our heart. And that's quite close. That's probably the closest natural shape to, uh, to have bees. Okay? This is also for several technical reasons. Uh, which I'm not going to explain now, okay? And, uh, and then also I met all these guys. So we go Aranya, Martin Crawford, Steve Pritchard, Bryn Thomas, and many others, like, like you know, Darren Doherty. From where I learned all, 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 all I know, basically, at the moment, you know, and all I have put in practice. <coughs> and I did different activities, uh, uh, learning, cooperating with people instead of competing with them. So cooperation, not competition, is another permaculture principle. So started to help uh, doing uh, pounding tires, uh, 
also the assistance during courses in the hardship in Brighton, and also some uh, festivals helping, etc. And then I start also to do small scale designs, started from small and efficient designs, not the biggest one. So I started to do some, I did some gardens in London, North London, is a garden in, on Green Lanes, for example. Okay, so we start from small, and then I carry on learning, and I start to visit places like Garden Organic in Rydal, here I was studying composting, a very you know, important science in permaculture. And carry on learning, and learning. And this is a sustainable water management uh, course with Ben Law, as you can see. And then teacher apprenticeship with Aranya Brin Thomas. Uh, here I was explaining uh, the A-frame, how uh, it was working. And finally, the diploma in applied permaculture. This is uh, the presentation at our organics uh, in Somerset. So I became a permaculture diploma. So starting courses in Italy spreading permaculture quite widely. So let's see my journey from UK to the Italian countryside. And uh, we can see that uh, I started from my flat in East Sussex. This was one of my permaculture design uh, for the diploma. And I ended up putting in practice what I've learned to Scagnello in Italy with 15,000 square meter permaculture small loading, which is this one. Okay. So it's quite nice passage. <laughs> and that was uh, because the problem is the solution. So why, you know, uh, it was the problem? The problem I told you before was the taxi, okay, with my health issues, etc. But uh, this taxi in real, which was the problem, it solved my problem. Why? Because I could make some money to buy the property in Italy, okay? And it brought me physically the taxi to Italy, okay? Every time to, you know, start to plant trees and to start uh, the project while I was still living in England. And I also did this through bread making, kombucha making, seedlings in the kitchen, and have wa a hand washing machine over here. And uh, this means uh, that I apply this principle which is used biologic and renewable resources uh, to get uh, to Italy. Planting trees, uh, working with nature, not against it, uh, so we just imitate the, 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 the ecosystem of the forest in permaculture, so I start to plant trees. And so the problem, the taxi was the solution because it brought me to Italy, my home. And then uh, I bought the house. But I needed some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I used the Magacho design to make it uh, work. Okay, so I can start to live on the land. And then how it is now? It's not finished. I just need uh, to do the plastering outside. But we live in there from one and a half year now. So we are quite happy with the electricity. It's an off-grid house. Uh, it's imitating the hardship system. Okay. Uh, and then, because each element has more than one function, I have founded the Permaculture Institute of Italy. Spreading permaculture around is one function, cooperating with people, another function, education, another function, and putting what I have learned in practice so I could walk my talk. And then this is the uh, permaculture design uh, uh, of my property, which I did also for the diploma as well, which I implemented. And uh, why we say permaculture design? Why this design is different from other designs? Because this is a sustainable design. It's closed loop design. What, what does it mean? It means that our waste become our energy to run the system. So we don't need to import anything from outside. Okay? So that's the real difference of permaculture design. And then I start to regenerate uh, a land, uh, building a permaculture from south side. Uh, just throwing also some seed balls around. I uh, know that some, you know, Spain and Garcia is like, ah, well, we don't need to see balls, etc. But uh, uh, it was fun with the children, etc. Was so I did. And uh, what you see this permaculture demonstration site it really is my ecosystem. So I designed my ecosystem where I'm happy to live with. That's the power of permaculture. That's the demonstration site before 2010. And uh, this is now. So here we go. We see it was just a 
bare land, we just, you know, a meadow. So we start to have here the uh, vineyard, here we got, uh, uh, we got see very well, but this is the uh, vegetable garden, a forest garden here with the compost toilet, a little dam, the house is completely changed, I just need to finish uh, the plastering, let's see. So let's see some inspiration from my permaculture project, see where I apply the, the permaculture principle on my land. Uh, this is, uh, we start from water, okay? Water is the main issue in permaculture. It's the main subject we have to cover when we start uh, a permaculture demonstration site or a permaculture design. So managing water. So how I did this, uh, applying another permaculture principle, which is the same function is performed by more elements. So we got uh, rainwater harvesting from the roof, we got rainwater harvesting from the land in a dam with a key line system. We got feeder channels which feed this dam plus by capillary action it will basically infiltrate under the soil and the water all the forest garden which is at the bottom. Okay? Then the chicken coop which rainwater harvesting again. So any problem I have on those systems I still have water in, 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 a, in a way. Okay? Okay, so then, uh, for example, each element performs more than one function uh, is another permaculture principle. How I apply this? Uh, in my vineyard. This is the vineyard, it's quite young, it's four years old. This year uh, we had uh, the first crop. And uh, why is performing more function? Because, uh, as you can see, we've got grapes here, but then we've got potato here, made on newspaper without digging. No big system, no? Bill Mollison idea. So I did, those are the potato which we harvest. And also I use uh, on the line, on the contour line, because uh, uh, all the grapes are on contour lines, uh, just to slow water down from the mountain, uh, with, uh, I interplant uh, with uh, comfrey, elegrisum, rosemary, and also aromatic uh, herbs. And then we start to have a yield. So the yield is theoretically unlimited, or limited only by our comprehension. So this means that if we comprehend where we live, we got a huge yield. If we don't comprehend, probably we will not have this yield. So a yield is actually a measure okay, of our comprehension. How much we understand from our land. And that's how we can work and see and go on and on with the project. This is more uh, photo for more yield, fruits of course, we have permaculture, there are lots of perennials. Permaculture is based on perennials, it's based on agroforestry systems, okay, not annuals. Uh, this is uh, this year uh, uh, crop from the vineyard. But then what I did in Ria, after all this special, all this, you know, harvesting, yields, etc. In Ria, in permaculture, we just produce soil, that's what we do. Okay, and I produce three centimeter average of humus in four years. And we can see how the land it was with no humus at all. And then we can see uh, this part. Okay, and this was a work for, of uh, four years. So we know by scientific basis that uh, to uh, for one inch of soil, we need between 100 and 150 years in nature, of course. So we can speed up this biologic system to produce soil more quickly. But I produce soil on quite a big uh, surface. We are talking about uh, 10,000 square meter. Okay? It's not just a compost pile. That's what uh, I did. Because for people it's not very you know, clear, this kind of thing, that uh, you just have uh, a three centimeter. Oh, it's not a great deal, you know. But it's a great deal, I think, because it's not easy to, to form this humus all over the, the place. And uh, I, study, I start to study microclimates, and in fact this year, for the climate change issues, uh, I start to plant uh, feijoa, and as soon as I planted, I have uh, a flower, uh, you know, a few flowers this year. A feijoa flower, very nice, you can eat the petals. And then also I have the gardening, uh, yugel kulchu beds with raspberry. This was the photo before of yugel kulchu, and this is after with the raspberries. Okay, so this means uh, that uh, everything in nature, uh, all, all being uh, in nature, uh, basically they create uh, their own, own garden, like I have done with my design. 
okay, creating my ecosystem. It's natural. This is natural. Every single being on earth, he does this. And then perennials and not the gardening, so I start to in in insert annuals in between the fruit trees of the forest garden. Okay. And then energy, energy cycle, another permaculture principle. We produce soil, no pollution. Why? Because we take our waste, we transform through warm, warm, warm cast in fertile soil. That's on this we can grow anything, anything. So that's our aim, to have a good soil, to produce good soil. And to do that also, I use biologic and renewable resources. This is an acid humic extract, which I use in the vineyard, I use in the vegetable garden, uh, to increase the uh, microbiologic bio life in the soil, adding bacteria, fungi, etc. Uh, this is uh, used at Lopate, lasagna garden on contour, this is, was uh, November 2014, which I did uh, for the first time last year. This year going quite well. And also relative position, another permaculture principle, a contour down, which mean, what, what does it mean, relative position? means to be in the right place. This down, it can't be anywhere. It can be only on contour, okay, on the contour line. No. And then appropriate technology, low energy tech that we can produce and maintain ourselves. So I built uh, some uh, uh, very nice, uh, lovely Russian stoves because in my place, you know, it's quite uh, cold in the winter. We can arrive minus 15, minus 20. And then the conclusion: uh, what next step? Uh, medicinal herbs, which I started already. So production of medicinal herbs, uh, which I already have some people that, that buy as well locally, and also more natural beekeeping because I got medicinal herbs. So bees, they would be very happy, you know, to collect pollen around. And then a lot of fruit juices. So this is my aim now. Uh, medicinal herbs, honey, uh, 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 grape fruit juice. And then also spreading permaculture more through more courses and talks in key places like this one and others. Uh, this is a Piazza Navona in Rome after the Senate of Rome hearing uh, last year. And then uh, here I am. Thank you very much. I love you all. Thank you. Guys, answer the questions together. It's a little panel. I think it would be a really fantastic opportunity. Don't often get that. Here we are. So, would you like to ask questions? I'm going to take note of the hands that are going up, and bear in mind that it's not always male dominated, it just often appears so at international conferences. <laughs> <laughs> and I myself have been teaching permaculture since 1993, <laughs> before some of you were born. Um, so, you, you, we'll start with you. Uh, question for you guys. Regarding your living library of your nursery, I was really interested to know if you're selecting your plants based on the ethnobotany of the bioregion or the latitude, and if you've got any plans on how you're looking at then implementing that over time. The, um, I think there's a lot of natives that are involved and researching and understanding what the ethnobotanical uses of those natives is so uh, simple and, and logical as like a starting point. And so, and then can those natives be selected further for um, their particularly useful features? You know, bigger berries, uh, more fiber, or more easily harvested. And then, um, so there's, there's a strong native component because those plants make sense and those are the um, things appropriate for that climate. But then as Dave showed, we use a term called analog climates, which is looking at other places in the world that share very similar climatic conditions and then source plant material from those spaces. So there's a, a very broad global collection in that library. Um, but then in acquiring those plants from those other sites, uh, also look into the native uses or the indigenous uses of those plants to understand how to get the most out of them and which ones are practical and then turn it around and cultivating them or training them for, um, again, the, the desirable qualities. What about Aranya and Pietro? Would you like to add to that, either of you? Native plants? Native plants, okay. Uh, in fact, um, I've started not to use native plants now because uh, there's a climate change problem, mm -hmm. very visible. 
So I already have a lot of native plants, but now I'm starting to put a jaw, as you can see, which is a subtropical plant, and it's not uh, an alpine plant, but it's going very well because uh, we got uh, a very dry season this year for four months, not one drop of rain on the Alps. This is quite strange, okay? And then we go extreme because uh, we can pass uh, between the, more, the, the day, the, the day temperature to the evening temperature. The difference can be even 20 degrees in one day. Celsius? Yes. Okay. So that's, we are suffering quite a lot of the climate change issue. Okay. So what I do, I do, I start to use plants which are not native from our place. And Fejor, it is going quite well. Also, I start to have also the pecan nuts which is from the States, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, pica, pica e nuts. Pica. Eastern US. Yeah. Eastern US, okay. So I, I, I put nine trees to see how they go, and also I put the raisin tree as well. So non nutting plants, but uh, I think uh, we are thinking first about our survival and our uh, safety in, uh, in food. Uh, so even uh, if climate is changing, uh, the native plants maybe they're not coping so well. And uh, in fact, the plums uh, last year I, I, I didn't have any harvest. It is here yet, but uh, you know it's quite erratic, you can say. So to cope with this erratic climate change issue, uh, I think it's, it's better to start uh, to do small intervention on uh, maybe not uh, not native plants, but plants that we think uh, through the observation they can go well and try maybe two or three of them, see how they cope and maybe increase them. What about you, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, well, there's, you know, Britain is the best place to grow apples, as far as I can see. <laughs> and uh, we're particularly, in, I live in the southwest of England, which is very good for growing apples and the like. So uh, my main focus tends to be around those things, but I love to grow unusual things. And as you saw, we've got grapes and apricots, which, you know, a fairly good microclimate to grow those, certainly in Britain at the moment. Um, but I'm always looking for uh, things for the future. And Martin Crawford, who got mentioned briefly here, he does the agroforestry research down in Devon, and he's recommended the varieties that we've been using in our garden. So we're picking things, making use of the existing knowledge within the system, and uh, yeah, I'm always happy to listen to, to Martin. So. Um, if I may be so bold, I'd like to add, because the, uh, I'm from Australia, and uh, the native plants are actually extremely adaptable to massive change in our continent. So I would be investing my resources somewhat in uh, acquiring the, the native plants that are being lost and, and integrating them. All right, so, um, yes, a question up there. Um, I was like really, really so into permaculture, I don't have even done a course for you yet. Um, Welcome. But yes. <laughs> what I'd like to ask any and all of the presenters is, all of the presenters, is permaculture on large areas of land, how do you plan or think you should apply permaculture to... A balcony, for example. Um, in fairness, around your ditch. Yeah, I only have show. a small garden. Yeah. <laughs> we do quite a lot of guerrilla gardening on local scrubland and plant uh, a lot of our trees there. Um, urban, I mean, urban permaculture is really important. It's Cities in themselves are quite unsustainable in the current form they are because we rely on transport networks to get things in and out, which um, we may not have that energy in the future to do that. But we can, in the meantime, increasing things like food security is really important. One of the key issues really in terms of growing food in the city has to be to do with soil contamination. And there's a really nice book came out recently called Earth Repair, which is all about how do you address, how do you remediate the soil contamination using mushrooms and Systems and different parts and so on. So, um. if, you, if, if you see from if you saw from my presentation, I started from a balcony yeah, in East Sussex and finished with 15,000 square meters. So it was a gravel passage between uh, balcony, allotment, gardens, and London. And what about Dave? Uh, so after I left the Bullocks, I, I moved away from their site in 2011 and I moved into a 900 square foot apartment in Seattle. That's where I live right now with my wife. And we are doing everything we did at the, not everything, but a lot of the things we did at the Bullets we do in micro in our apartment. So I've planted up the entire parking strip, the space between the sidewalk and the curb is now full of fruit trees and currants and berry bushes. 
I've gone into the rockery and I've stuck in fruit trees, I've put in vegetable beds and salad greens beds, and I've taken over the weed patch, and at this point I have carte blanche from my landlord to do whatever I want because I focus on making it look really good. So focus on aesthetics I think is really important if you want to move projects forward in an urban context, and that's what Paul and I will be talking about tomorrow uh, when we do a, our workshop on uh, making landscapes, permaculture landscapes more legible. Thank you. We've got another question here. Yes, um, I'm a garden designer working mainly in London with kind of private residences, and, and the gardens are small, usually you know, very small, five by eight meters, so let's say, or patio garden, alchemy. Um, I try to sort of educate clients a little bit about sustainable <laughs> design, because uh, they don't know the approach we put from that. So, you know. But I would like to ask for some kind of maybe like tips and advice. What's the most important thing actually to do uh, in this urban small garden setting with homeowners? Okay, well, planting huge trees. <laughs> <laughs> I will bear, <coughs> I've been a, a huge advocate for chives and green onions, and I think it's a nice gateway plant for a homeowner. Um, and I'll just, I just love chives, right? Every meal, whether it's soup, sandwich, breakfast, lunch, dinner, eggs, meat, salads, vegetables, um, you can eat the flowers, you can eat the base of it, you can eat all the greens, everything except for the dirt and the little rooty, fibery bits at the bottom. Um, and they're just a really nice one to introduce people with. And uh, as Pietro was saying, the, the perennials too, because in gardening, people are often turned off by the amount of work necessary to rework and rework a bed every year and how to manage and maintain. Um, encouraging people to try out a couple perennials that are really easy to maintain, really easy to access, and really easy to use, uh, I think is just a really great sort of entryway for, for a lot of people who are sort of uncertain about this stuff. Yeah, people aren't going to be able to grow all their food if they're interested in the aesthetics, but something like an apricot tree or a fruit tree is then beautiful flowers. Um, we turned up with apricots at my parents a couple of months ago, and they couldn't, it was like, that was grown in your garden, because they didn't, didn't believe it was possible. So there's also that element of surprise of saying that you can, if you have the right microclimates, that you can grow things, and looking for things that they really love to eat, you know, high quality. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of leverage points, I would actually focus on water as the direction. If you can get them to do either rain gardens to manage drainage in a place where it rains a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you can get them to do any sort of rainwater collection systems that would help mm -hmm. to get them further into the system, addressing sustainable water demand and stress and strain on municipal sewer and wastewater treatment systems, so on and so forth, uh, stormwater systems. I think that's a big one, and that doesn't even involve any necessary increase in their time doing maintenance or whatever it is. That's just something that you can do to help those folks have a, an easier footprint. And I would add to that, after this morning's fabulous keynote speakers, um, the, to reduce the food waste. So if it's just, mm -hmm. if it's easier to go to a beautiful looking uh, worm tower, there's these towers now where you can have a worm farm that sits in the garden. It could have a beautiful decorative top. Depends what you're into. And they just take the top off, pop their food waste down there. It's faster than walking to the bin or the garbage disposal. And it's integrated so that they feel that they've done something. That, that's what I feel. Um, it's so, so also, if I'm going to say something to her as well, uh, they say, we need food to survive, so food is good. <laughs> <laughs> right. We've got time for about three more or four more questions, so I might pester you. Who's got one? Yeah, it's probably a silly one, but again, going to urban garden, what would be a permaculture solution to cats? Kind of doing everything up there, doing everything. I've got that one. I'm going to quote So, assuming digging into your annual garden is the issue? Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of stray cats around our apartment, so I've just basically taken six inch welded wire and laid that down and I plant my vegetables and then I, um, I actually attach chicken wire to that and so the, the, where the, the biggest problem is when things are when it's bare soil right when you're yeah, just waiting yeah, for yeah, lettuce yeah. to come up and so I lay things you know I'll have it suspended two or three inches off the soil and just basically I'm covering it with fencing essentially right. and that makes it they don't want to get in there and dig through the little holes and all that so yeah, yeah. I actually put it down for squirrels because during this time of year when walnuts are falling off the trees and I'm trying to get my overwintering lettuces established 
the squirrels are just like little rototillers going through the garden. Mm -hmm. so I'm just like, out! Yeah, here we had to cut back the bay tree, and I've been using, using that, but then of course you can't plant it. So it's just right, 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 yeah, that's why you're talking about this fencing. Yeah, okay. And it's the horizontal fencing versus the vertical, because they can sort of hop right over it. You've got to make something that they can't get into or don't want to walk on or put their yeah. paws on. Yeah, lay a panel of fencing on the ground. Yeah, so, it's so the, the kind of weld mesh, basically. Yeah, I use the weld mesh as just a firm structure, and then I put chicken wire I attach to that. Because oh. chicken wire is just too floppy. <laughs> <in itself. laughs> it would only be there for a couple weeks. Because once everything sprouts and comes up, yeah, then yeah, typically yeah. they aren't yeah, going yeah, in. Yeah, I just keep moving. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But there are other solutions to that, too. So if you, if you need to use something as ugly as that, you can make it very <laughs> intensive. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and you could actually cover it with a, a layer of soil so that you can't see that it's in there. The cat will learn that it's there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's one way. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of planting things that they didn't like, but we could say if I haven't found anything that they didn't. <laughs> but I just use sticks, actually, because I've got um, native pigeons that love to eat all the seeds. Yeah. So I just put a lot of sticks down. So that's what we've been doing with the remains of yeah. the bay tree. So it's not, not quite yeah. as yeah. Um, ge geometrical. You've got to put a, put a sandbox over in the corner and see if that attracts yeah, them that's more. That's <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if you learn from the wildlife managers, uh, and you need to keep, let's say you want to keep cats out because you've got platypus, which I doubt. So then the fencing can be quite strong, but at the top has to be loose because cats don't like a loose um, wire at the top. Um, so they go, oh, no, don't like that. And they'll fall back and not get and eat your platypus. Oh. But, um, <laughs> platypus protection. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Randy, did you have something to add to the cats, uh, apart from composting yeah, them? Holly leaves are very good. Oh, yeah. And the lower branches, holly leaves, when they're browns oh, by animals, holly. then they become oh, spikier. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you cut them, they'll have the same effect. They'll become spikier. Then you have, you have to get in there too, though. So. <laughs> get your own cat. Yeah, yeah. Get your own cat somewhere. That's true. If you if you have a cat, you'll get less feral cats. But I, I'm imagining that's not the issue. There are always so many cats. Yeah. 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 Right. Any more dance. questions? Surely there's some things you'd like to. Well, as a newcomer to Facebook. your guys' perspective, what what opportunities are there for not the most sort of financially endowed people? How can we get involved? Yeah. Can we volunteer with farmers or whatever and try and get more experience that way? I can, I can say uh, my structure in Italy. So we, we, we developed a structure in Italy which was based actually on the Agricultural Association pre time at the beginning which is basically uh, doing a permaculture design certificate for uh, 550 euros, for example, just an example, uh, for people working, working people. So then if you come in two people, in a couple, it would be probably something like 800 for two, you know, etc. We scale down. But then we got a very cheap price, which is 25 euros for uh, unemployed people, okay? And then also now, because in Italy, we, 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 got quite a crisis, you know, people don't got any money anymore, like before. We also do barter, uh, how is that we say, barter? Barter. Barter, yeah. barter for the 250 euro uh, per person, okay? So that's our structure, how we start to cope with these kind of problems, okay? Which is, uh, yeah. And then after that, uh, after the design certificate, uh, uh, you can do some appret apprenticeship with me, free of charge. Uh, and uh, then you can give it in exchange uh, whatever uh, work or relationship or whatever anyway and uh, and then after that basically uh, that, that, that's all yeah. so that's the structure basically. Thank you. Aranya, do you have something to add to that? Uh, well the, the Pump Culture Network in Britain um, there's a land network and so there's lots of opportunities to go and work on projects. There's intentional communities uh, where I've just taught in Devon. Uh, they have people who go and stay there and, and work and, and they're involved in that project. It's the, uh, the one intentional community land-based project I know of that's designed from the scratch with permaculture in mind. Uh, that's eight, ten years ago. 
and uh, and yes, it's you know there's lots of opportunities to read things on the internet and so on as well now, but it's I think you're just kind of looking for um, I don't know. It's, we're always trying to help people at all levels to try and get into permaculture, and um, you know, you've got like Pietro to go to a land-based project. There's always the opportunity to go and work on the land and do kind of work exchange time bank kind of things as well. So. About you guys. Um, well, for starters, I think there's a lot of like in the last ten years, the amount of content that's available online has just exploded. And while I don't advocate exclusively like just looking at stuff online, you know, find a community garden patch where you can practice it. Talk to a neighbor who's got just an empty yard and say, hey, if I bring you a box of tomatoes every week for all the summer, can I put in a bed and grow tomatoes here? And you will learn a ton by doing that. Regardless of what you actually get out of the garden, you will learn a ton. That is your biggest yield, right? And then um, I know that both Aranya and Paul and I have recently written books that are a lot cheaper than taking a course. They're not a substitute for a course, but they're excellent entry-level texts. And I think all three of us have done a lot of work to try and make it far less mystical than some of the fat tomes of yesterday <laughs> up here. So we've got a thing up here, and I'm sure all those books are available down in the bookstore downstairs. And may I add to that that one of the, um, the driving forces of permaculture is that we try to view the problem as the solution. And I actually know people who've been in exactly the same position of earned money from the need. And what they did was they said, well, I'd love a course in my area. I don't have a teacher in my area, but I have the time and the connections. And I know a lot of other people in my similar situation. We, we could all uh, make a promise, or I could actually just be a bit greedy and get all my friends to make a promise, to, to get someone else to come in and teach. And so they've actually been a facilitator on the first few courses, which means you're running around most of the time you don't actually learn, but then you, you, you're generating an interest in your own area and you've, you've created an income for that teacher and you've created an opportunity for yourself. So that, that's a, it's a great opportunity. You just have to have the will and the, the discipline to be organized. Right, let's take... Uh, may sorry. I add one piece sure. to that? Um, I'd also just advocate for uh, looking into trades. You know, um, there's the whole scope of permaculture and it as a design system and a perspective, but um, there's a bunch of different little nuances inside of that that you could access, whether it was plumbing or electrical, or if you want to get into plants, you know, could you find a job at a nursery? And you're not going to be um, doing explicit permaculture and getting paid for it necessarily, but you're going to be learning some amazing skills, you know, and working for a year or two at a nursery is a really great way to learn plant propagation, plant ID, all this other stuff, and, you know, hopping between some of these things and looking for apprenticeships and ways that you can get paid to learn uh, would be sort of the application of permaculture to, to some of that problem, I think. Okay. Well, let's have one last question, yeah. Dave, um, sorry if I missed this in the talk. You said you were going to come back to the 700 square foot house. Yeah. And how, and how that works that for a family of four? Yeah. Did I, did I miss that? Uh, yeah. They live outside half the year. Okay. So they're just out, they, they spend very little time actually inside this box that they've constructed. It's only, you know, we get out of the rain in there, keep warm in there in the winter. Uh, but the rest of the time, they have outdoor sleeping.